The first Emmy Awards ceremony of 2024 is in the books, and I've got my thoughts on who won and who didn't right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my recap of the 75th Annual Emmy Awards Charts with Dan, which is usually getting released right now. will be out tomorrow. I'll have a full breakdown of the four-day holiday weekend here in the U.S., but I wanted to talk about the Emmy Awards. I mentioned that it is the first Emmy Awards broadcast of 2024. That's because it was delayed from last fall due to the writers and actors strike. So this is the ceremony that usually would have happened back in probably September. It was delayed to January, but then we'll have a second Emmy ceremony later this year in the fall. And the weird thing about this ceremony was that because it was delayed so much, some of the things that you saw people winning for were actually like a season back. So for example, The Bear, which won a lot of Emmys, also won a lot of Golden Globe and Critics' Choice Awards over the past week. And all of those awards were for season two of The Bear, but the awards that it won last night were for season one. So we've had The Bear collecting hardware for two seasons, all within the span of the same week. That's because of the eligibility windows with the Emmy Awards. Even though they delayed the ceremony, they didn't change those eligibility windows so we're getting awards for stuff that aired as far as a year and a half ago now usually on these awards show recaps i will headline with the big winners but i'll summarize most of what happened at the emmys last night the bear beef succession we'll talk about those three shows of course but i wanted to lead with the show that didn't win any emmy awards last night and not only did it not win emmy awards last night but it has now officially gone through its entire run without ever winning a primetime Emmy Award for the show itself. And that is Better Call Saul, what I think is one of the best TV shows ever made. Last night was its final chance to win a primetime Emmy Award for anything other than its online content. It's won a couple things for the short things that they put out on the web, but it has never won an Emmy Award for the actual show that went over the air, and now it never will. It's official. And when you look at the history of Better Call Saul and the Emmys, it's not like every single year they were just against the same unstoppable juggernaut and never really had a shot at winning. The series itself lost Best Drama Series seven times. It lost to Game of Thrones three times and it wasn't even prime Game of Thrones. It was late Game of Thrones. It lost to The Handmaid's Tale once, and then it lost to Succession three times. Bob Odenkirk, though, lost to seven different people for Best Actor in a Drama Series. He lost to John Hamm for Mad Men, Rami Malek in Mr. Robot, Sterling K. Brown in This Is Us, Billy Porter in Pose, Jeremy Strong in Succession, Lee Jung Jae in Squid Game, and then Kieran Culkin in Succession last night. And really, when you look at that list of people, it seemed like they were chasing the, I mean, I don't want to distress, these are all great performances, but the flavor of the month, really. Who's the hot actor right now? What's the hot show right now? And again, totally disregarding the fact that I think Bob Odenkirk was doing great work year in and year out, completely overlooked every single time. Jonathan Banks was nominated four times for Best Supporting Actor. He lost to Peter Dinklage twice, John Lithgow for The Crown, and Ben Mendelsohn. Giancarlo Esposito lost to Peter Dinklage and Billy Crudup for Best Supporting Actor. Ray Seahorn, who was maybe even better than Bob Odenkirk, only nominated twice, lost to Julia Garner and Jennifer Coolidge, both of whom had already won Emmy Awards for those shows. Julia Garner beat Ray Seahorn, getting her second Emmy Award for Ozark. Jennifer Coolidge beat Ray Seahorn last night with her second Emmy Award for The White Lotus, and especially Jennifer Coolidge. I love her, but I feel like I've seen her do her acceptance speech thing like four dozen times. I understand people like Jennifer Coolidge. They like her performance on the show, but they awarded her yet another Emmy for that same role and let Ray Seahorn's work go completely unrewarded. And I know some people say, well, you know, it's an honor to be nominated and that is the reward. And yes, that is great. It's great that she got nominated. It's crazy that she only got nominated twice, but there is some prestige that comes with winning an Emmy Award and it is validation. It's validation that says your work was not just among the best, it was the best. And I think that Ray Seahorn's work on Better Call Saul, especially these last couple seasons, could lay claim to the best work that was done on television. 
Don't even get me started on Michael McKean, who was never even nominated until after he left the show. He was nominated as a guest actor playing Chuck, but never as part of the regular cast. And to be fair, it wasn't just the Emmys. Better Call Saul went 0 for 6 at the Golden Globes. Only Bob Odenkirk was ever nominated from the cast. The show went 0 for 9 at the Screen Actors Guild Awards. It never won an ensemble award. It never won an individual award. And it's just so crazy to me because, again, it's also not just the acting. It never won an award for writing. It never won an award for directing. It never won an Emmy award for anything technical, lighting design, sound, cinematography, nothing. It won zero awards for anything that they put on screen for any of those seasons for a show that many people think could perhaps measure up to favorably, and some people say is even better than Breaking Bad, the show that it spun off from. I've seen some people comparing Better Call Saul to The Wire in that they're both great shows that never got Emmy recognition, but The Wire was overlooked pretty much completely. It got two Emmy nominations, I think, both for writing. Better Call Saul got over 50 Emmy nominations and never won one of them. So that, to me, honestly, is the biggest takeaway from the awards last night. It's that Better Call Saul will now go completely unrewarded as far as the Emmys go, obviously fans and everything else, but as far as the Emmys go, it will never have an Emmy win to its name. And that to me is just absolute insanity. And I think part of the reason that things like this happen, as I mentioned before, is that the Emmys tend to just bombard specific shows with awards. And last night was a great example of that. Let's take the major categories we saw for narrative shows. There were seven that were given out for a drama series, seven that were given out for comedy, and seven that were given out for limited series, anthology, or TV movie. In comedy, six of the seven awards went to The Bear. In drama, six of the seven awards went to Succession. In the limited series category, six of the seven awards went to beef. So out of 21 awards that were given on air for narrative television filmmaking last night, 17 of 21 went to just three different shows. And this isn't an attack on the quality of those shows. Succession, I think, is some of the best TV that's ever been made. And it's its last season. So if it was just kind of a rare thing, oh, in its final season, Succession just swept the Emmy Awards, then that would be one thing. But it happens over and over again to shows that are in their last season or not in their last season across different categories. And it just feels like the Academy as a whole says, okay, well, this year, this is the show. And that's what everybody votes for. And I just wish that they'd spread it around more. First of all, because more shows and more people get that recognition and it raises the profile. And also just because as an award show, it gets kind of boring when halfway through, you know who's going to win in every single big category. Because it was very obvious last night where the show was going from about an hour in. And it extends to other categories too. Last week tonight won Best Writing for a Variety Series for the eighth year in a row. RuPaul's Drag Race won Outstanding Reality Competition Show for the fifth time in the last seven years. And The Daily Show with Trevor Noah was a big new winner. It won Best Talk Series, but only because last week tonight was moved out of that category where it, of course, won as it has the last seven years. It was great to see the team from The Daily Show go up there and get to accept that award. And it was also great to see John Oliver actually be at the Emmys to accept the awards that Last Week Tonight won. Often he's not there because Last Week Tonight is in production in the fall when the Emmys usually are. The show's on hiatus right now, so he was able to actually attend the ceremony. So there were some things about the shakeup that I think worked in the show's favor. And I think I think maybe contributing to the samey feel of the award show last night was that the Emmys was the third in a string of award shows. We had the Golden Globes, the Critics' Choice Awards, and now the Emmys all within about a week of each other. And at each one of those shows, it was the same three shows dominating the bear succession and beef. So it felt like I saw the same winners going up over and over and over again. Again, I like those winners, but when you see them all making versions of the same speech, although I think some of them saved their best for the Emmys last night, you do start kind of going like, okay, well, I mean, were there any other shows that were on the air this past year? Now, Emmy wise, taking the other award shows out of it, even though the same shows were winning the awards, at least the winners 
weren't repeats. First of all, we'll talk about the bear. As I mentioned, this was season one of the bear that was winning all of these awards. So all of the bear winners were not previous Emmy winners, which was a nice change of pace. Chris Storer won three Emmy awards, his first three for writing, producing, and directing the show. Jeremy Allen White, Io Debris, and Eben Moss Bacharach were also first-time winners in their acting categories. So it was great to see some first-time winners there. When we go to Succession, which again, dominated the major awards that were given out last night. Matthew McFadyen won his second Emmy, but Kieran Culkin and Sarah Snook brought home their first ever Emmys for this final season. And Kieran Culkin in particular, I thought, gave a really great speech. He starts by throwing his jacket on the ground. He seemed very emotional about the win. You could tell that this is very important to him. And he got the approving kiss on the lips from Brian Cox, which is kind of hilarious because that's really what his character, Roman Roy, had been seeking from Cox's character, Logan Roy, for his entire life and would never get or could never get. Yes, I was frustrated that there wasn't a whole lot of variety in the awards that were given out, but I can't really argue against Succession's wins, and especially Kieran Culkin. I was actually rooting for him. Jeremy Strong had already won. Brian Cox is great, but he was barely in the season, and Kieran Culkin was so great in this final season. I'm glad that he was awarded even though it came at the expense of Bob Odenkirk. And this is why you don't wait to give awards to somebody, because who knows, in their last year of eligibility, maybe there's somebody else there that's just so good, you have to give them the award. And if you tell the board I said any of this, I'm just going to say it was a negotiating tactic. And you know what? Maybe it is, but it's not. So fuck you. There's a lot more Emmy stuff to break down, but before we do, I want to thank the sponsor for this show. This episode's brought to you by Rocket Money. If you keep up with the channel, then you know that last year I wasn't keeping track of my money like I should have, but I've learned from that mistake, and this year I'm changing all of that, and that includes using Rocket Money. And think about what you spend every month. With all of these different streaming services and bills, do you really even know how much you're spending? I did a full breakdown of my finances with Rocket Money and found out that I was still paying for services that I didn't want that cost me over 250 bucks a year, and that's real money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. All you have to do is fire up Rocket Money, and you have a complete breakdown of where your money's going and how you can better manage it. And if you find a subscription or service that you don't want anymore, all you have to do is tap, and Rocket Money will take care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash Dan. That's rocketmoney.com slash Dan. Rocketmoney.com slash Dan. Nisi Nash Betts also had a great acceptance speech for Dahmer Monster, which the announcer kept saying is Dahmer Monster all night. And you know what? I think we should normalize congratulating ourselves for big achievements. I think that is the healthy kind of ego. I want to thank me for believing in me. One big achievement belonged to Sir Elton John, who became an EGOT winner with his live concert specials win. If you don't know what an EGOT is, it's basically an award show quadruple crown. It means that you won a competitive Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. So this was the Emmy that Elton John was lacking. He's now won all four. I actually had the chance to see in person a triple EGOT at the last Creative Arts Emmys ceremony that I was able to attend, where Tim Rice, Andrew Lloyd Webber, and John Legend Legend all became EGOTs at the same time when the Jesus Christ Superstar concert special won an Emmy Award. There are not many EGOT winners. I think Elton John is like the 20th or something like that. So that is pretty big entertainment history that was made. Unfortunately, he couldn't be there, but it was still great to see it happen. I said it when I talked about the Golden Globes, but Beef and The Bear are both shows that I missed last year. And as a member of the Academy, I actually abstained from voting in a lot of categories because I miss so much TV, it's tough because, you know, this channel is usually so locked into movies and that's where a lot of my focus is going. It's movies and awards and stuff like that. I like shows on streaming and stuff, but I generally am very slow 
to catch up on them. There's some stuff that I'm watching now that's like, you know, four or five or six months old. I mean, I'm not even done with The Crown yet. I've got one more episode of that. But The Bear and Beef were both shows that I heard were great. And I've just got to figure it out. I've got to get better because I want to be enjoying these things in real time. And honestly, I'd, I'd like to be reviewing more of it here on the channel for you to help you discover it. And so you're not like me and just sort of chasing the trend. And that's just something I've got to figure out. Right now, I'm able to do a handful of shows here on the channel as far as streaming because it is a time commitment. But I think part of it is just kind of reshuffling my time and fitting these shows in because it is an important part of entertainment. And I don't want this to be just a movie channel and I want to enjoy the shows too. Speaking of beef, there were a lot of cast reunions last night, and I was surprised at the Grey's Anatomy reunion that Katherine Heigl showed up, considering that she left not on the best of terms with the show. Of course, she was there with the cast. She wasn't there with Shonda Rhimes, who actually created the show. And there are definitely some cast members that had a bigger beef than Katherine Heigl. But it was interesting to see her as part of that group. And they did that a few different times last night. They would bring out the cast of a show or do a reunion or a partial reunion of the cast. And I thought that that was a really fun idea, but they didn't really have a whole lot to do with them. I mean, you had that Cheers reunion. You got Ted Danson and Kelsey Grammer, John Ratzenberger and George went and Rhea Perlman out there and they just are there to present an award. That's it. I, I wish that they had come up with a, a better thing to get these castmates to do once they got out on stage. The Emmys have tried to streamline the show as the definition of entertainment has changed and streaming has come into the mix. One change that I'm not a big fan of is their inclusion of limited series, anthology series, and then TV movies all together in one category. TV movie and limited and anthology series have their own separate categories as far as the overall projects, but the acting categories, the directing and writing categories are all combined into one. And I think it does a disservice to movies like Prey and Weird, the Al Yankovic story, which both were nominated for multiple awards at the Emmys this past year, but were up against shows like Beef and Dahmer and other ones that are really a different kind of storytelling. So you had Daniel Radcliffe in Weird going up against Stephen Yun for Beef. Well, Stephen Young, of course, won the award because Beef has been winning a lot of stuff, but it, it almost doesn't seem equivalent. I was happy to see that Weird did win the actual Emmy Award for Best TV Movie, but I felt like it didn't really stand a chance in a lot of the other categories. So this is somewhere where the Emmys have tried to cut down, I think, on the time and the awards and everything else, but I might think about splitting at least those performance categories back out into a separate thing because it just doesn't seem equivalent and it doesn't really seem fair to the actors and the writers and directors of the TV movies because I think they're always going to come in behind longer form storytelling. The Emmy telecast itself was, I mean, the, the word that kept popping into my head was workmanlike. It was just there to get the job done. Anthony Anderson came out. He did a kind of a bit about, you know, TV theme songs and stuff, but he was really just kind of there to keep the show going. The ads in the show were out of control. It was crazy. I started watching like an hour and 15 minutes late. I think, because I didn't want to watch all the ads. And even then, I had almost caught up to it live by the time the show was over. It was like five minutes of show, five minutes of ads. Four minutes of show, six minutes of ads. And they kept plugging things, like the Tina Fey, Amy Poehler thing. Oh, they're going to do a special Emmys Weekend Update edition. That sounds fun. They're plugging it for like an hour, and then by the time they did it, it was just them presenting an award, which again, it's sort of like the cash reunions. If you're going to go to all the trouble, then actually have them do something other than present an award. It was fun to see them together, but I think if you'd actually written something for them to do other than just some funny setup to handing out an award, it would have felt a little bit more satisfying. And those cast reunions generally felt like that for the most part. My favorite was actually the Always Sunny cast, which is a show that's still on the air, going out there and talking about the fact that they were surprised that they actually do an Emmy show every year because the show's never been nominated. But you also had Rob McElhenney and Danny DeVito talking about the Emmys that they've won for other projects. 34 nominations in five years versus zero nominations in 16 years. That math is bad. To me, that was the most successful way to harness the gifts of a TV cast and also keeping the show on track. And I wish that they'd been able to do that a little bit more 
with some of the other reunions. However, the trade-off with doing away with a lot of the scripted moments left the show able to embrace some genuinely emotional ones. Christina Applegate, for example, got a great standing ovation. Her reaction to that was really, really heartwarming. In case you don't know, she recently retired from on-camera acting due to multiple sclerosis and the fact that she's just not able to act on camera anymore. And so it was great to see the industry and her colleagues pour their heart out to her and to her work and to honor her work. And then you also had some funny moments that I don't think were entirely scripted because Pedro Pascal made a great joke about Kieran Culkin and how Pedro Pascal had hurt his arm that they had to bleep out of the show. Uh, it's online uncensored, by the way, in case you didn't catch it at home. Kieran Culkin beat the shit out of me. A great reaction shot, by the way, from Kieran Culkin. That's that's a funny bit. That's a way to make a good bit work. It's 10 seconds, you're out, and then you're going to go back to presenting the award. So really, overall with the Emmys, I mean, it was a fine show. It didn't really stand out as great or terrible in any way, which really puts it over the Golden Globes this past year. I love Succession, so I was happy that Succession won. I'm sure that once I catch up with Beef and the bear, I'll probably be happy that they won as well. My only real qualms were that it sealed the fate of Better Call Saul to be overlooked for its entire run as far as Emmy wins, and just the lack of unpredictable wins and kind of knowing where everything was going to go. I get it, sometimes that happens in one category or two, but when it pretty much runs the gamut across all categories, it makes for not the most interesting show. What did you think, though? Did your favorites win the Emmy? And unless three shows were your favorites, then the answer would probably be no. Are you as miffed by the continued overlooking of Better Call Saul as I am? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, thanks so much for spending part of your day here with me. Be sure to stay tuned right here on the channel. Charts with Dan will be out tomorrow, and I've got more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.